What's going on, everybody? You are here with me and my friend, Dr. Dean. Somebody, Luke, has wanted me to get on the show for a really long time. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to do it with Luke, but we're going to do it today. And uh, Dr. Dean is hopefully going to give you guys a lot of information. Uh, this is episode number 46. Doctor, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your credentials? Okay. First of all, thanks very much for, for inviting me on. Uh, mm. Like you said, it was, it was something we were hoping to do with Luke. But... Yeah. So people who know me, I am the formula of a UK supplement company called Supplement Needs. I have a background in pharmaceutical chemistry and a PhD in synthetic chemistry. I guess I'm best well known throughout the UK for being one of the educators for Jordan Peters and his website at one point. Um, mm. And then obviously my ideas that I've put out over the last few years surrounding applying what's known as functional medicine to bodybuilders okay. and getting bodybuilders to appreciate the root causes of how their health gets maybe slightly damaged or I guess affected with the use of anabolic steroids and how mm -hmm. we can actually try and address the root cause rather than using, I guess, pharmaceuticals to, to band aid. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know what? Uh, I had a kind of a plan for the show, but I feel like the health aspect is really important. So do you mind if we jump into that first? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. So I recently, one of the things a lot of the viewers of the podcast know is a doctor told me back in 2010 that I had high blood pressure. And he said that I had to retire from bodybuilding. He's like, you got to retire. This is no good. You have high blood pressure. And I didn't want to quit. So I didn't take the blood pressure medication and I didn't quit. It took me five, six, seven years later to figure out that you could take the blood pressure medication and still bodybuild at the same time. And had the doctor told me that in 2010, I'd probably be a lot healthier right now than I am because I would have had low, like my blood pressure would have been in check for a lot longer. So can you explain to people one of the questions I have is it's not about blood pressure medication, but can you explain to maybe bodybuilders how they could keep their blood pressure in check before getting to the point where they need medication? So when we sort of look at what drives blood pressure on a whole, obviously it's the, the blood vessels constrict. And then we need to, I guess, assess why the blood vessels have caused constriction. Mm -hmm. It could be a genetic factor where you're, you have a, an enzyme that you produce called angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. Okay. And that, that causes your blood vessels to constrict. And that's where we get ACE inhibitors as a blood pressure medication. And what they okay. do is they stop that enzyme from constricting your blood vessels. So that could be genetic. Just as you get older, your genetic expression of that enzyme can increase and it could leave you susceptible to high blood pressure. So. Mm -hmm that would probably involve having to take a medication like the ACE inhibitor to overcome that genetic aspect. Okay. The next sort of thing would be sort of, I guess, unchecked um, red blood cell count and obviously your hematocrit. So how the percentage of the red blood cells within your, your blood, basically. Yeah. The more red blood cells that are there, I guess the more uh, viscous your blood is going to be. And it's going to create, I guess, a, a pressure differential where your heart has to actually work harder to push that more viscous blood around. Yeah. So that's more so than if you look at what would it be the root cause of that would basically go back to how anabolic steroids or androgens themselves mm -hmm. act at your kidneys to make EPO naturally mm. okay. and act at your spleen to make more red blood cells. Okay. So it's sort of like, you know, it's an artifact of AAS use Can, and in order. Uh, I, I just want to, say, sorry, I, can, I just, um, okay. So a bunch of questions are going to come up in the middle of your answers only because it's just really complex and yeah. I have to, I have to like, I hate to interrupt people. I really do. But the, but I have to make sure the viewer understands some of the questions. So any steroid or any anabolic you take is going to increase red blood cell count as, as a potential side to how they act at the androgen receptor. Yes. Okay. So carry on with your, with your point. I'm sorry. I just wanted to no, make no, sure. No, that's no. So, so people don't actually realize that, uh, you know, we want anabolics or, you know, uh, steroids to act on the androgen receptor to increase muscle mass, you mm -hmm. know, true genetic expression. 
But another side was that, you know, it, they're not selective in their action. So when androgen receptors get activated, they can have a myriad of different effects throughout the body. Mm-hmm. And one of them is at your kidneys, you'll make more EPO. Okay. And that'll make you make more red blood cells. So in order to sort of combat that, you're sort of looking at either, you know, reducing your your total dosage as to speak so yeah. that you're no longer in that super physiological range, you know, outside of what your body would make normally. Yeah. Or, you know, you're looking at blood phlebotomy to remove some of those red blood cells. Blood uh, phlebotomy is just when you go to the blood blood clinic and they drain a yeah, pint of exactly, blood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Where the blood let out a pint of blood. And with that, you see then your, I guess red blood cells take about 90 days to mature. Mm-hmm. So basically, you ha- you're giving yourself a three month period to allow that pint of blood to replenish within your body. Okay. So that that would you know that would yield a drop in blood pressure because obviously you're taking some of that viscosity away. Mm-hmm. Um, then other things, again, it, like this is how complex it can be with with anabolic steroids. They not only act on androgen receptors, you have throughout your body you have other steroid hormone receptors yeah so we know that steroids can act on glucocorticoid receptors and okay. control inflammation okay so now you have a now you have a scenario where your body is going to have um a, a lower chance of inflammation surrounding you know to training so you have better recovery yeah yeah but they can also act on what are known as mineral corticoid receptors okay and these things control mineral balance in the body like potassium and sodium yeah Yeah. and by doing that that can manipulate the fluid balance of your body so you can either have you know a higher fluid balance where you have more water in in your blood or you have less water and again that will affect the viscosity of your blood so what obviously so which so which is is having too much water in your blood bad or too little or is is it one or the other it's sort of like you want a fine balance in the middle okay. where you're not dehydrated or, you know, there, there's not too much fluid within your, your blood vessels. Okay. Obviously, the more dilute your blood becomes, um, I guess you could say then the less viscous your blood volume is, mm-hmm. and obviously the less blood pressure that's going to be caused by it. Yeah. So but, in, inherently, just on those three points alone, if you're taking anabolics, you're probably going to have high blood pressure at some point, depending on how long you've used them for. Yes, there is a there is a quite a strong possibility, and again, that's where it comes down to being one of the most simplest things for your health as a bodybuilder is taking your blood pressure at least twice a week. Okay, because I was listening to uh, I think George Farah was talking on one of, um, I think it was some garbage channel. It was Generation Iron. No, everybody knows I hate Generation Iron, so don't. don't worry. <laughs> but anyway, so he was on there talking about um, it. Actually, triggered. That's kind of what triggered my question. Was he said that if you have to take a blood pressure medication, that's not necessarily a good thing because we're not addressing the root cause of the problem. But from your explanation, it seems like there isn't really a solution if you're going to be taking anabolics because you're going to get the red blood cell count increase, you're going to get the water increase, all of these things. So is that statement he made, and I'm not asking you to like criticize him at all. I'm just saying, is that statement kind of false that there's a root problem? No. Well, if you think about it, there is what he is saying is hold valid and that the root cause to high blood pressure potentially in a bodybuilder would be higher red blood cell count. And obviously mm-hmm. the root cause of that is the use of androgens causing more EPO. So it is sort of, you know, you are getting to the root cause but how you address that root cause isn't as straightforward as say a normal population person, because yeah. obviously we know the drug is causing that side effect. Yeah. So guys, well, I guess, I guess my point was, I think the way he was talking about it was there's another root cause, but from what you're explaining to me is it's not really, I mean, it's either genetic or it's going to be a symptom of steroid exactly. use. Yep. And so a guy shouldn't, you know, a bodybuilder, a man, man or woman, whatever, out there training, shouldn't feel guilty for taking. Because I thought there was something wrong with me. I'm like, oh, I got to take blood pressure medication. There's something wrong with me. So you shouldn't necessarily feel that way. It's just kind of part and parcel with what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, if if inevitably that you know, obviously, if you can't control blood pressure naturally, as to speak, so either you know, reducing the dose 
bloodletting, um, potentially certain compounds like natural diuretics, which will help remove, you know, excess water from the blood. Mm-hmm. Um, if you can't go down that route and it does require pharmaceutical intervention from a, I guess, a muscle hypertrophy perspective, they're not going to really impact your ability to build muscle tissue, but yeah. they will have a great impact towards your overall health and longevity. In a good way. In a good way. Yeah. yeah and I yeah. mean, obviously the whole point of controlling blood pressure, I guess, on a, on a global health aspect in your body is your kidneys. Mm because the kidneys are actually what takes the brunt of the pressure through your body. Your heart, your heart would be almost secondary to the damage that high blood pressure can do to your kidneys. Yeah. Um, that's something I've actually experienced. I had a little bit of a kidney elevation. I have it under control now, but I think it was acute, obviously not chronic, but yeah. the doctor told me it was a result of not taking any blood pressure medication for a long time. So you know, one of the reasons I keep bringing this up, I, I brought it up on the podcast before. And I want people that are listening to know that this is, it's just another supplement. It's kind of like taking our, our vitamins every day. Yeah. It's some, something we need to do to stay healthy, correct? Yeah, correct. And I mean, even in the UK, um, some of the prescription medications for blood pressure have actually come off license in that a pharmacist can actually prescribe okay. blood pressure medication to someone based on taking their history of blood pressure. Okay. So, so it, yeah. You mentioned um okay, so you mentioned natural diuretic and you mentioned the water balance in the blood and this triggered another kind of question is when I'm retaining a lot of water, I feel stronger and I feel I know this is very simplistic to say, but I feel like I'm growing better. Like I feel like my body is more anabolic for lack of a better term. So why do we I know the water imbalance is causing an issue with the blood pressure? But how do we keep that feeling and not affect our, you know what I mean? Like, how do I keep that water retention? Because I like it in the off season, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So, so obviously we're sort of looking at here from an, an aspect of extracellular versus intracellular fluid retention. Mm-hmm. So intracellular fluid retention would be the fluid that's retained inside muscle tissue yeah. and around connective joint tissues. That, that's what we want, again, to protect our keep some sort of integrity to the joint in the off season. And again, that allows us to lift a little bit heavier without having any sort of overall joint stress. Okay. The extracellular fluid balance where we're retaining fluid outside of our cells within our blood vessels is what we need to address. Okay. So obviously we want to ensure that the kidneys are actually filtering that water that's within the extracellular space out. Mm -hmm. Um, And I guess what, what you're sort of, pointing at there is um hydration as an overall so looking at you know your your mineral balance with sodium and potassium intake and we know that a lot of people neglect potassium intake yeah and that that is a big thing that leads to that intracellular water retention so Um, if you have a lot of i'm sorry to interrupt i just again like this just so if you have a lot of sodium in your diet let let, just correct me if i'm wrong i'm gonna make a statement if you have a lot of sodium in your diet, but not enough potassium, you're probably going to retain water outside the muscle. Yes. It, yes. To a certain extent. Correct. But if you have, yeah. if you have the matching amount of potassium or the proper amount to the ratio, you can yeah. help pull that water into the muscle cell. Correct. Yes. And it then also comes down to magnesium and taurine balance in the body as well. It is quite complex. Yeah. Well, obviously sodium that's in your body, the higher the amount of potassium you excrete out. I'm sorry, say that again. So when you have high levels of sodium in your body, how your kidneys filter, you actually force potassium out at a higher rate. I didn't know that. So so that's why you need to make sure that the two of them are balanced because your body actually favors pushing potassium out through the kidneys. So so as bodybuilders, when we say, you know, eat more sodium because it's going to help you more with muscle contraction, that's not necessarily false, but now we have to increase our potassium as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You need to keep it, keep an eye on the two as a balance. Um, okay. Is there, is there something other than whole food that would help us with that? Like I eat a lot of potatoes cause potatoes are high in potassium. Yeah. 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 From, from a food perspective. Um, yeah. P- potatoes or, you know, really when we look at, at certain things, it's, it's so much easier to get potassium through, I guess, using, um, potassium based table salt so the likes of low salt 
would be like a 60% ratio of potassium to sodium. How do we, and, you know, can you just buy potassium based salt? Yeah. Yeah. You can buy low salt in the, the grocery store, but we and want you know, the, but, but we want the sodium too. So it's half, it's half potassium, half sodium, the salt. So and that's both. And that's better for us than just eating sea salt. Well, it's going to help to, you know, keep your, so your potassium, so your RDA for potassium is about 4.7 grams a day. It's very high. Okay. And true whole foods, it, it, it's very difficult to sort of get to that amount, even if you are following a bodybuilder's diet. Yeah. So I find low salt as a, an alternative to when you're seasoning your food, you're, you know, increasing your sodium intake, but you're keeping up with the potassium demand as well. That makes a lot of sense. So what's the, if 4.7 is the recommended uh, amount for day for potassium, what's the recommended? Is it 3000 for sodium? Sodium, yeah. So, so it's about almost three is to one potassium to sodium. And that's how your body sort of favors the, the balance of excretion. Okay. Um, now you meant, you mentioned magnesium and taurine too. Where do those fit in and how do we make sure those are balanced? So magnesium is a very interesting thing because it's, it's sort of like the second to first most abundant mineral in your body. So it's involved in so many different enzymes. One of them with bodybuilders would be one that's called COMT. So it's called catechol O methyltransferase. Okay. COMT's job in your body is to metabolize estrogen. Yeah. And it also is involved in removing dopamine from your brain. Okay. So if you think about it, high levels of androgens, of steroids, can slow down that enzyme, the COMT enzyme. And this is sort of where I, I put out sort of this sort of theory of how something like trembolone can cause insomnia. Mm-hmm. And if we look at how trembolone exerts its effects as an androgen, it will heavily deplete magnesium. So now you're slowing down that COMT enzyme and you're now having a buildup of dopamine in your brain before you go to bed, say. Okay. So now your brain is highly stimulated and it's very difficult for your body to fall asleep. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's where we start to see if we start to increase magnesium intake in say pre-contest bodybuilders, they have no difficulty with sleeping and they have no difficulty with levels of hydration. That's interesting. What level of magnesium and what type of magnesium do you think is best for a bodybuilder to take? So for, for a bodybuilder, definitely magnesium bisglycinate would be at the one of the top anyway. Which one's because that? Because magnesium bisglycinate. Okay. Magnesium bis. Okay. So it's magnesium that's attached to glycine basically. Okay. So you're getting, you know, you're getting elemental magnesium when you take it. So yeah. say if I, you take a 500 milligram tablet of magnesium bisglycinate, yeah. you're getting about 130 milligrams of magnesium and then the rest of it is glycine. Okay. Now glycine as an amino acid is very interesting because it can have effects on GABA receptors in your brain. Mm-hmm. And those GABA receptors are inhibitory and they cause your brain to relax. Yeah. So now in a, in a, say in a pre-contest scenario, when you up someone's magnesium intake from magnesium bisglycinate, you're supporting that COMT enzyme with magnesium because that's what it needs. Mm-hmm. So it's now able to clear out excess dopamine that can come as an artifact of anabolic steroids yeah. and allow your mind to relax so you can fall asleep. That's what I need. I can never sleep. I don't, <laughs> you know what, man, when I'm dieting, it's a nightmare for me. Like, well, I wish I had a nightmare. I could, I can't, I literally like I'm up. If I do fall asleep, I'm up like every hour. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I developed like for supplement needs um, and it was mainly my own idea because obviously I was competing at a national level in Ireland um, and I work shift patterns. So I work morning, you know, day shift and night shifts. Yeah. And I figured I needed some way of support my body of how to sleep. Yeah. Like what was the, what was the biochemistry of how your body falls asleep? Yeah. And, and I came to this conclusion of these six different ingredients that support your sleep pathways in your body. And one of them was magnesium. Okay. As soon as I implemented the, the six ingredients that's in my sleep stack, along with a higher level of magnesium, mm-hmm. say the first two years of, of competing enhanced it was, you know, a struggle to fall asleep some nights is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. 
as soon as I implemented this, I slept like a baby through the next three to four preps. It was but like there's this, but <laughs> there's this nothing, sort of, you know. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say it, it sort of goes back to what we were talking about with the root cause where, yeah. you know, you get that light bulb moment where all of a sudden you realize, oh, fuck, that, you know, the magnesium is what supports that enzyme and that enzyme is what clears these neurotransmitters out of my brain. But there's nothing else in that sleep product that would make you sleep. Like, I mean, there is, you said there's six ingredients, but is the main one, the magnesium? Is that why you know it's that, no, it's that one? No, no, it's, it's a combination. So when, like, for example, my sleep stack has five HTP. So basically okay. to fall asleep, to make it simple for people who are listening to fall asleep, you need to have high levels of serotonin. Okay. That makes you relax and calm down so that you can fall asleep. Okay. And then to stay asleep, you need high levels of melatonin while yeah. you're asleep. Yeah. And that's where if you take melatonin as a supplement before you sleep, you tend to sleep for only about two or three hours and then you're awake again. Yeah, that's what happens to me. <laughs> and that's because yeah. melatonin's half-life is so quick oh. that it doesn't keep you asleep. What that's you right. need is your body doing its own conversion. I from, see. And actually, melatonin gets converted from serotonin. Mm -hmm. so with the sleep stack i figured okay if we increase serotonin with 5 htp which is the precursor to serotonin so you give a high dose of 5 htp and vitamin b6 which converts the 5 htp to serotonin okay so now you have this high serotonin environment and you calm down and obviously steroids themselves deplete serotonin to an extent as well okay and that's you know that's where we can lead to certain people who get aggressive because of serotonin getting depleted causing an aggressive state okay so the 5 HTP and the vitamin b6 help you to fall asleep and then what i done was i included magnesium bisglycinate like what we discussed there to help yeah. clear out the dopamine so now you're not you, you know like when you're on prep you can be wired but tired so you're lying yeah. in bed and you're like i really need to sleep but your mind is racing yeah. That's because of the dopamine that's in your brain. So obviously the magnesium's uh, action there is to help clear out that dopamine. I got it. And now you're starting to calm down. You shouldn't have told me your formula. I have my own supplement <laughs> company. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm just gonna. <laughs> I know the secret now. No, I'm just joking. Um, I, I, and I mean, sorry. like, literally, like looking at the, you know, the, the biochemistry of sleep. Yeah. It was sort of then, you know. Well, if serotonin is needed to fall asleep and it needs to be converted to melatonin, how that happens is through vitamin B5. So if yeah. I a big dose of vitamin B5 before bed, if I have a large pool of serotonin in my brain while I'm sleeping, that vitamin B5 is going to be converting it across to melatonin yeah. and keeping you asleep. I see. I see. And that's sort of, you know, how I've approached helping bodybuilders with the education I've done with thinking, you know, what is the root cause? Yeah. And how can we get down to that, you know, deep level and make it simple for people yeah. to. You know what I like about that is most sleep products, because I, I studied a lot of supplements because I'm, you know, obviously I started my own company. So I'm trying to like, I, I want to do a sleep aid one day and I'm looking around and most sleep products are kind of exactly what you said. They're just a bunch of melatonin, which yeah. I've taken, I've taken some of them. Right. And they just, they yeah. get me to, they get me to sleep and I end up waking up at three in the morning, like, you know, wide awake. So it's interesting to see that you've actually used ingredients that make the body do what it's supposed to do instead of forcing it to do something. You know That's what I mean? Exactly the approach. Yeah. Yeah, because before, like before I come up with the, delving into that sort of research on sleep and the sleep stack, I was also buying, you know, different companies sleep products with working night shifts. Yeah. And most of them did either have, you know, a high dose of melatonin or a high dose of phenobut. Yeah, and it was just yeah. like you know, someone taking a sledgehammer to your head. You 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 fell asleep, but when you woke up, you're real groggy, and it didn't really feel like you actually got a restful sleep. Yeah. Whereas with the sleep stack, it was that okay. Now I understand how my body has to do to fall asleep, and then what I need to take to keep my body making melatonin so I stay asleep yeah. all night. I gotta admit though, I like Fenibut. It, yeah, it's, it's, it puts me in a good, it puts me in a good mood the next day. Like when I wake up, I'm a little groggy, but I'm in a, I'm in a happy state. I don't know why. When my, when my wife used to compete, uh, and this again was before I, I came up with the, the sleep stack concept, like she'd rely as well on, on some of the sleep products if she was having a bad night on prepping. 
she used yeah. to always say like taking any of the sort of products of Fenibut was like someone coming away and taking you on a cloud. Yeah. 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 I love it. I love that feeling. No. <laughs> um, I want to go back a minute though. Cause you said uh, something about our bodies producing EPO. Yeah. Right. Why are, this is a totally kind of off topic from what we were just discussing, but it, it triggered a thought, which is, a lot of guys now are talking about taking EPO and this is not something I've ever done or know any other pros that have done, but I've heard this become more popular recently. And what I think to myself is if EPO thickens the blood, why would you want to take more shit that thickens your blood? If that's the dangerous part. I know. And that's that again, I, I've never understood that concept and it's become a little bit popular over the last four to five years, obviously with, the access to recombinant EPO as mm-hmm. a, a pharmaceutical drug mm-hmm. from a body pill billing perspective. I think the, the sort of logic there is that you're going to get increased blood flow. You have more blood that can carry uh, oxygen and obviously nutrients, but you are heading into a scenario there where you're driving your hematocrit to a, an unsafe level. Yeah. So to me, it, it does not really serve any sort of purpose. I mean, in because my again, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say again on, on an overall, what is that extra blood having any contributing factor to, you know, muscle hypertrophy and even a, a mechanical stress point of view from training or yeah. even, you know, nutrition or for, you know, enhanced bodybuilders activation of the androgen receptor. It's, it's not partaking in any of that other than having more red blood cells to be able to carry oxygen. So you might have, I guess, maybe slightly better endurance yeah. that might tie over to say if you're doing high rep work yeah. but again I, I don't really uh i don't really see it being of huge benefit versus the risk yeah i was just going to say i don't understand why like if you're already producing more red blood cells with anabolics or androgens and then you're adding epo now and you're producing even more yeah okay i might get even if i got five percent better aren't i increasing my risk of blood clotting or anything like by an exponential number exactly yeah 100 percent. yeah and it's not only like you said there the risk with high hematocrit is with platelets with having a clotting event as opposed to again the pressure not only the high pressure of the blood when it's that viscous yeah you now have you know basically blood that's like sludge if there's a micro tear or anything that happens inside the artery wall and mm-hmm. platelets aggregate to stop that event, mm-hmm. you, are, you are heading for a serious adverse either stroke or heart attack yeah. because of the viscosity of the blood. Yeah, I don't, I think people are, you know, I'm all for, I'm all for chasing every avenue to get bigger and better, but there has to be a balance of, you know, obviously we're doing damage to our health in some ways by, you know, taking anabolics and all these things, but I believe in trying to mitigate them as much as possible. And I don't think, it just doesn't make sense to me. It just says that no. the reward is not there. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, um, you mentioned serotonin. This is another interesting point that I, I hope you can give me an answer on because I tend to be a little more aggressive than the average human. And it might be, you, you mentioned something about serotonin buildup or no, not buildup, uh, depletion yep. and aggression. Yep. So how does somebody, you know, they, they say roid rage or people get edgy when they're on steroids or whatever. How does somebody keep a, a, a proper serotonin level to, to avoid the aggressiveness other than like the sleep aid you were talking? Is there something we can do? So, so obviously, like you said, there was serotonin. It comes from tryptophan, which is the base amino acid. And okay. tryptophan goes to 5-HTP, which is 5-hydroxytryptophan. Okay. Now, 5-hydroxytryptophan can actually, you know, um, cross over the blood-brain barrier and have its effect to create serotonin in your brain. Okay. When, when you take androgens, they help speed up the transport of neurotransmitters in your brain. Okay. So there's a more higher potential for you to use up your pool of neurotransmitters faster. Okay. You also have an enzyme which breaks down serotonin in your brain called monoamine oxidase A. So M-A-O-A. That enzyme can either be sped up or slowed down depending on your genetics with okay. anabolic use. Very strong androgens like Tren can make you very aggressive, but then there's you know a come down period where 
you can almost have this sort of down period following a, a, you know a very aggressive event say post training you can feel a little bit down obviously yeah. because of you're trying to replenish that serotonin pool in your brain and ultimately how that happens is obviously with your your amino acid intake okay. ingesting enough tryptophan per okay. day okay. will help keep up with the demand of that 5 HTP and serotonin what's a what's a proper level of tryptophan per day <sighs> very that, difficult to say well i just mean but, because let's take like i'll use myself for an example especially when i'm dieting i get a little edgy and i get a little like you know i have the, I had those down periods you talk about like post training yeah so what is what is there a dosing requirement that i could use to help you know avoid that not necessarily like there's no dose say per per weight per pound that you know you need x amount of tryptophan per body weight yeah and it's it's really comes down to i guess experimenting with different intakes of either tryptophan or 5 hdp to find that balance okay but the other thing is with neurochemistry it gets very um complex in that when you start to disturb serotonin mm -hmm. you start to have a knock-on effect to dopamine what does that mean so, so in one sense if you take a high amount of tryptophan to boost your serotonin yeah there's a potential that you can go it's like a seesaw you boost your serotonin you're going to drop your dopamine so, so i'm sorry i'm sorry to interrupt you i just want to maybe figure this out for myself and anybody else listening yeah. serotonin keeps you calm yeah it's this sort of feel good happy hormone that, right you know it can have different different sort of effects on people but yeah the main one is keeping you calm okay and i guess centered so dopamine does what keep you alert so dopamine yeah it'd be more like a a stimulatory neurotransmitter so it gives okay. you ambition it gives you drive you know when you have high levels of dopamine it gives you and um, i guess higher sex interest all these sort of different things that we okay. associate with with reward okay so so when you when take you boost serotonin yeah your dopamine has a potential to drop off so although you're 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 raising your serotonin to make you feel better yeah. your sort of drive might dissipate because of it's it's such a fine balance of how your brain manages these neurotransmitters is it impossible to have both elevated at the same time i'm assuming so um no so you can have someone who's highly aggressive and highly driven where they have but they're you know, still calm levels. yeah <laughs> you know like it's 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 and, and this is where you know this is where things get very complex in post cycle therapy yeah because when people go through post cycle therapy and come off to restore their hpta yeah they can go through this period where their mind just feels like utter shit yeah because because on one aspect they've taken say a high level of androgens that's depleted their serotonin and they never done anything during their cycle to resolve that so now they have a really low mood from the depleted serotonin mm -hmm. but also testosterone has a secondary action in that it can increase dopamine yeah so now you have a period where your pct you have low hormones you've low serotonin and you've low dopamine oh god so now also you could then end up being lucky and your pct is successful and you start making testosterone again naturally but you can still have this neurochemical imbalance in your brain where you have low serotonin and low dopamine and this is where guys you know in the pct period having recovered naturally end up with no sex drive yeah because of an artifact of the dopamine metabolism from their steroid use okay so this is fascinating and confusing at the same time sorry i'm asking so many like <laughs> I, I'm just trying to, <laughs> I got my little notepad here. I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to learn everything you learned in like all your science classes all in like an hour. So, no, um, so, okay. This is, this is something that's always, I've always wondered about that I want to ask you about. So sometimes when I start a stack, I will, how can I say this? Let's say end a stack. Okay. So I've done a, okay, let's say start. So once I start a stack, I notice the effects will grow and grow and grow and grow and I'll get better and better and better and better. And then after a few weeks, I feel like I get stagnant. Let's say I run a 12 week cycle. There's almost like six to eight weeks of it where I feel like the effects aren't going up anymore. I'm just kind of leveling off. Yeah. And that's, that's completely in line with the pharmacology of the, obviously how the 
drugs clear on, on, a, on a simple level of pharmacology the esters that say are attached to the drugs yeah are slowly building up if i say week five or week six with something for example like enantate yeah or cypionate yeah by week five or week six you're hitting this stable level of dosage okay so when, when you start say 500 milligrams at week one with each successive you know drop off and half life until you get to week six mm. you're going to see you know half the concentration of week one drop off and then you yeah. know that feeds into week two and it keeps building until you get to this point where it's stepping up and then it stays steady okay and you sort of stay at that steady level then from week six to the end of your cycle so how do i and, and there's i have a question for the end of the cycle too and it's not about pct necessarily but how do i is there any way to keep it going up without increasing the dose no, because you're going to reach, you know, you're obviously reached a point of, I guess, uh, saturation in the body of compound to androgen receptors. So is saturation, so, is saturation a good thing though, or is, is it better to be on that upward swing? Like, would it make sense to do like a six week cycle and then come off and then start again? So you're constantly getting that boost or does it matter? From a health perspective, I don't think, like, obviously what you're saying there is if you do a six-week cycle, you've built to a certain level. And this is where, obviously, you have to think about, um, not to get really complex, but you have two concepts to pharmacology known as pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. Okay. So pharmacodynamics is how the drug acts in your body, and pharmacokinetics is how the drug moves and excretes out of your body. Okay. So... If you're using, you know, medium length esters like an anti or cypionate for ease of injection, so you're not bloody injection every every day or you know every second day, yeah, you, you're going to reach a period where, like at week six, that's when the ester is starting to stabilize in terms of the pharmacokinetics and how the drug is being administered and how it's excreting. Okay, so you're keeping this steady level. What you're sort of talking about there is that you'd you'd go all in with you know a fast acting ester where you reach that, you know, week six concentration in the first week, run that for six weeks and then bring yourself back to sort of a baseline dose. Well, I don't, I, there. I don't know if that was well thought out. I guess the question is, is there any way, the main part of the question is, is there any, cause I like that climb, right? That yeah. boot, that boost you get for the first six weeks when you first start, I like that climb. And when you level off, I know there's a period where you're going to level off, but, it doesn't feel as good as the climb to the six weeks. So I'm trying yeah, to figure yeah. out if there's a way to keep that feeling. So I guess w with that climb, so let, let, let's take, for example, this was someone who's natural, who's never done any sort of steroids and they're doing their first cycle. And let, let's just say their, their test level for, you know, UK people is 20 or for US it's say 800. Yeah. When they start administering steroids, say they, they take a, an arbitrary dose of maybe 300 milligrams of testosterone, that by you know week five, week six is going to have a level of somewhere in around 80 nanomole, which is maybe somewhere around 2,500 in, in nanograms per deciliter. What does that mean? So, so what, what, what you've done there is you've gone from a natural level of, say, 800, and you've sort of tripled your level of testosterone. Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying, yeah. So... This person now is going to experience going from, you know, a natural level to this super physiological unnatural level yeah. over the course of six weeks until it levels off. Yeah. So obviously during that six weeks, your body is going to have certain processes change. So their nervous system is going to become more resilient because of potentially they're making more DHT, which is yeah. making their nervous system stronger and they're able to handle heavier loads. Yeah. When you get to week six, you know, you're starting to hit this stable level of androgens and stable level of conversion to estrogen or conversion to dht so you no longer see this rapid strength increase because the again yeah. the nervous system is now adapting to that I new see. threshold dose i see and I I, get it. I, as you said there if you want to keep seeing that climb you have to keep taking the dose <laughs> up provided that you know your, your body is able to handle it because yeah. there will come a point where not that it's sort of saturation but your body is going to keep up with that increase in dose by making more androgen receptors to occupy yeah. the drug. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of where it comes down to intelligently um, picking dosages 
at the beginning and yeah. not, you know, playing off going to the next step, the next step, the next step, that really truly being honest with yourself and saying, have I really maximized everything at this dosage before yeah. I give my body another push? Because yeah. the whole bro concept is that, oh, I take a break and it clears out my receptors, which yeah. is, which is BS. Yeah. How your body makes more androgen receptors is either you give your body more androgens and genetically you make more receptors or you go through a period where you return back to a physiological level and your body then has a chance to again come back to a natural level Mm -hmm. and when you take the dosage back up to where it was before you have again genetic expression of androgen receptors so question so question on that so basically what you're saying is let's say go back to the scenario you used guys producing 800 naturally yeah goes to 2,500, feels amazing. He can keep going up in dose to try and feel better. But I know from my own experience that there's a period of negative return on that. So you can't keep just going up and up and up. Exactly. Um, But the question is, how long does he have to go off before his body will go back to the 800 where he can get that bump again? So I guess this is where it comes down to looking at that concept of blasting and cruising yeah where you know you do your blast which is really your your cycle and then your cruise your cruise is more so a chance that unless you're a very high level competitive bodybuilder who can't afford to lose muscle mass Mm -hmm. the cruise should ideally be a period where you come back to a physiological level of testosterone okay but control you you control it with trt okay sorry i have to that's what i want to ask so if i let's say i'm taking a thousand milligrams a week. Yep. And then that's my blast. And then I want to yep. go, okay, I'm going to cruise now. So I go down to 250. Yep. If I go down to 250, my body will come back to its natural level. No, you're still going to be controlling your testosterone level through uh, exogenous testosterone. No, of course. But what I guess I said the wrong, I, I phrased it wrong. So what I'm saying is when my body comes back down to that, level that i've set it at like the 250 or whatever yep i can get that bump again once i go back up i don't have to like how long do i have to do that for i guess so if you're at so if you're at a dosage of a thousand milligrams and say for example that the ester was an anti just to keep things like what we were speaking there yeah yeah in five to six weeks time your level will drop off through the okay. excretion of that drug Okay. So when you, when you stop your 1,000 milligrams, this is where people, again, fail to realize that when you stop a 12-week cycle, it doesn't, like, magically end at 12 weeks. Yeah, yeah. It still takes, you know, the, the half-life of that ester to clear out. So when you finish your cycle, especially if, say, it was an anti-ester you used, you've still got at least two or three weeks where you're still at a very high level of androgens mm-hmm. before you fall back to whatever dose you choose as your cruise, whether it's 250 or, you know, yeah. 150 yeah but by that six week mark you're sort of back to that sort of lower androgen level Mm. it allows you know depending on i guess for amateurs you are best going back to a physiological range Mm -hmm. purely from a health perspective okay main reason being is your liver this is a, a, a really unknown thing to a lot of people your liver cannot heal itself at high levels of testosterone okay so if you're outside that natural range and you, you used oral steroids and then you went you know, on your cruise, but your cruise still has you at that super physiological level, your liver can't send in these stem cells to regenerate the liver. Okay. And that's where it becomes a little more important that amateurs who aren't on, you know, obviously for professionals, this is a little more difficult because there's an expectation there with a career and yeah. you know contracts and money and whatever else that that risk has to be i guess accepted yeah but for an amateur who's maybe striving to get to that level at some point would be best off coming back to you know a physiological level should Unless, sorry, should he come back to zero like would he come like if i'm an amateur and i'm not like you said it's not about money or anything should i come back to zero or should i still be bridging so you should, so with the idea of bridging, you'd have two options at that point if you were an amateur. You'd either do PCT and you'd come off everything and get your body, you know, back to making its own natural testosterone. Mm-hmm. Or say that person was going to use 
AAS again at some point, you know, in three or four months' time, it would probably make more sense for that person to manipulate their testosterone level with mm-hmm. TRT for okay. that, you know, seven to eight week period to allow baseline health to come back again. I see. Um, the question I have for you is about coming off was one of the one of the ones I originally wanted to ask you was you mentioned that there is a four to six week period that takes time for the test to kind of leave your body or yeah. return to normal levels. I actually feel like I get better in that four weeks after. How does that make sense? Like if I'm running a stack, usually, cause some people, and explain to this to me too, like some people taper off, they'll go like, let's say they're taking 800 to go to six, four, and it'll stop. Yeah. I just usually go, you know, if I'm at eight, I stop. And I don't know if that's wrong or not, but what I'm trying to say is after I stop, I actually get better for four weeks and I've always explained it to myself and forgive me if this is bro science, but I've always explained it to myself as my body is getting healthier because toxins of less toxicity. Cause I feel like everything's functioning better in that four weeks post cycle. So yeah, I don't know so, so, if you can so explain to, any of that. I guess. Yeah. From a, a sort of simple logic, what you're explaining there is technically sort of correct. So during that four to six week period, after you stop your cycle, if you stop and don't, bridge either to a trt dose or you you taper down there is going to be a period where your body is metabolizing your testosterone that's within your body you know that you've injected yeah Yeah. and it's slowly tapering off back to a lower level so yes you no longer have a period where when you when you hit that six week mark like we explained earlier each subsequent injection after that is maintaining that steady level when you stop, you now have a chance for your body to actually metabolize what is built up to an extent in your body and roll off. Okay. And obviously in that period, not having, when you do an injection, obviously you're spiking your testosterone level because of the androgens being put into your body. Yeah. And that, that spike is no longer occurring. So you no longer have, you know, say on a Monday when you do an injection to choose the genetically your aromatase is going to be slightly higher your conversion to dht is going to be slightly higher none of those events are now happening because of you stopping and obviously then you have a period where your body is able to metabolize and excrete out the compounds that built up would that make more so that you know that they're they're toxic and they're causing toxicity it's just that your body is now returning back towards a physiological baseline why would I be getting better at that time though? Cause like my sex drive increases, my, so, like, everything starts to feel better. So if you, if you think about it, you're no longer causing these androgen spikes with each injection. Yeah. yeah. So now your, your body sort of, although the levels are declining, it's sort of staying at a steady rate of decline without okay. having any initial spike. Like I'm saying with each injection, you know, with each injection, yeah. you're going to get a small spike because yeah. of putting that dose in. Yeah, you're no longer seeing that that sort of wave happening as your body's excreting it out. No, I, I understand that what you explained, but what I'm saying is, if my body is dropping, like if the level is dropping, yeah, but I but I feel like I'm getting better. I don't. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, from from a an overall androgen perspective, yeah. your brain's neurochemistry could be starting to balance off as well because you're no longer putting subsequent doses of androgens in. I see. I see. That makes sense. So. I want to ask you about timing because you mentioned times of injections and this has been a constant debate recently. So there's two questions here. One is about microdosing and one is about timing your injections for the body part. You're, you're worried about, you know, a lagging body part, Yep. which I don't know which one you want to take first, but since we were talking about that spike in test, it kind of raised that thought. So you were saying if I take a shot Monday, I'm going to get a boost on Tuesday. So let's say Tuesday's my leg day. Is it smart to do my shot on Monday so I get that boost for leg day? Like, is that kind of what you're saying? Not necessarily because when you hit that point where the, the pharmacokinetics of the drug, so the clearance of the drug is stabilized, mm-hmm. yes, you do get a spike the following day after the injection. But when you reach that sort of steady baseline, it's not a huge spike. I see. I see. So it's not enough that, you know, that, oh, on Tuesday, because I've done my injection on Monday, I'm going to have a higher androgen level on Tuesday. It's okay. going to, you know, contribute to significant growth. So and time, sort of, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, and that's sort of where then to lead into sort of microdosing. 
the whole point of microdosing is that you can now put a constant level of androgens in every single day so there is no variation to mm -hmm. the, the peak and trough of how the drug clears day to day. Mm -hmm. You're basically putting in 20 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 20 milligrams, you know, and it's staying constant every single day. Yeah. So I have a, I had a guy on the podcast a long time ago. He's from the, re his, the, the name was the research station was his Instagram. I think he, now he's in jail, <laughs> but so I don't know how credible he was, <laughs> but the important part I took from the podcast that day was the microdosing, which was, he was saying like, for example, when it came to testosterone, he was saying that your body cannot use more than 700 milligrams in a week. So he's saying those guys, and, and let me finish before, I know you're going to probably destroy all this, but I'm just going to tell you what he's saying. So he was saying 700 milligrams a week. And he was saying, you know, these guys that are taking 500 milligrams three times a week or two times a week or whatever, they're not getting, they're not getting the full benefit of it. Number one, because they're taking too much at one time and they're taking too much overall in the week. And I guess his point was if you took, what he was trying to say is if you took a hundred milligrams every day, your body would use that because you're only taking hundred milligrams at a time instead of taking this big dose all at once. So that's how he explained microdosing to me in the benefit of it. So is that, is that the, it does that make more sense or does it make more sense to take the two five hundreds? So from, I guess, a stability perspective and obviously from what we spoke about the pharmacokinetics, microdosing a small amount daily will yield more stable levels as opposed to doing two large bolus injections. Okay. So, so the old, old approach, let, let, if you sort of... If you sort of think about it, if you do one injection of 500 milligrams a week, you'll get a spike to five, you know, whatever dose, whatever level of testosterone 500 milligrams creates in your body. Yeah. For, for arbitrary sake, say it's, you know, a hundred nanomolar or, or somewhere over 3000. Yeah. Goes, goes there. And then over the next seven days, it just drops off like that. Mm -hmm. Then you do another injection the following Sunday and it spikes and it drops off. <clears throat> yeah. So now you choose to say, for example, when you do that one big spike, the following day on the Tuesday, you're going to have higher levels of aromatase and uh, uh, um, 5-alpha reduction to DHT because of that huge spike with one injection. Okay. Off. okay. So now you start to think, okay, what happens if I do two injections? So I do Monday and Thursday, so you get one spike. So you actually half the dose. So you do 250 on Monday, 250 on Thursday. Yeah. Same total dose, but you have half it. So now you're, you're sort of going to... 250 is giving you one spike and it's sort of dropping off a little bit and then you're doing another 250. So that is going to spike a little bit higher than the first one. Yeah. But on an overall basis with say an ante, when you get to that six week mark, the two levels are going to be fairly similar. Yeah. Except, yeah. except the 500 once a week is sort of going to go a little bit higher and it's going to have a roll off. Whereas the 250 is going to have a spike on a Monday, spike on a Thursday and they're sort of like, you know, it's not as mm -hmm. huge. Now, if you go daily and you go every single day and say it's 500 milligrams and you go to whatever, 62 milligrams every day. Yeah. You're, you're going like, you know, 62, 62, uh, every single day like that. And yeah. it's, it's varying like this. So you're going to have lower levels of aromatase and expression to start because you no longer have a huge peak. Yeah, yeah. But by week six, that small daily injection builds up to the same level as the 500. Yeah, yeah. You know, as the half life is increasing each week, but because of you've done a daily injection, the level doesn't vary significantly. So when you get to the six week mark, every single day your sort of level of testosterone is fairly well matched. Okay. Whereas if you don't, you know, one big injection, it's sort of like going up and then coming down and then going up and then coming down. You know, it's but I don't know anybody who does I don't know anybody who does one, right? Like most people do like the majority of people I know will do like, you know, 250 Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And so it's 750 total. Or if they're doing 500, it'll 250 Monday and Thursday. I just feel like the question I guess I need to know is, is it really more beneficial for putting on muscle or is it just a matter of stability of your hormones and your body? The, but the, it's not the, la it's the, the ladder there, the ladder. So, you know, from a muscle building perspective, okay. 
if you think about it, the 500 milligrams, if you give that initial dose spike of 500 milligrams, as opposed to every single day being, you know, 62 yeah. milligrams, yeah. of course, that initial spike of androgen is going to be way bigger than the, the 62 milligram dose. And your total yeah. testosterone level is going to be way higher with the 500 milligrams. Yeah. Now, is that, is that going to lead to faster muscle growth doing that one big massive injection than the smaller one in terms of how much your body can utilize? Yeah. Not necessarily because, again, your genetics will drive how much androgen receptors you have in your body to handle that dose. Yeah. It's more so than an artifact of what happens within your body side effects wise by creating that high dose as opposed to being patient and understanding that regardless of the total dose you choose per week, the injection frequency is what's going to play on the stability of your hormone level. Okay. And obviously when you get to that sort of five or six week mark, when the hormone starts to balance out in terms of, you know, the excretion versus the uh, distribution, mm -hmm. it, it, it sort of then comes down to, I guess, like I said, with the 500 once per week, the day after the injection, you're going to have higher levels of aromatase because of creating that big spike that then drops off. Yeah. So um, you're saying muscle growth wise, then there isn't much difference, but you're saying side effect. What I'm understanding is in terms of side effects, there's a pretty big difference. There is. Yes. But also because if you think about it, someone's total testosterone level. So again, this is where it sort of gets a little bit complex for the first couple of weeks of the cycle. So the mm. person who's taken 500 milligrams in one big whack once a week may have say faster progression to someone who's on 62 milligrams daily. Yeah. But when they reach week six, the level of testosterone, total testosterone, is pretty much the same for both scenarios. It's now that the person who's taken one shot a week is going to have potentially greater risk of aromatization and creating DHT because mm. of that large spike once a week as opposed to daily injections. Um, mm. So the, the sort of microdosing sort of plays on a, you are going to keep more favorable balance towards side effects. Yeah. Whilst I guess, yes, there is going to be a level of patience that someone who's doing one big massive dose a week is going to have a higher level to start. Yeah. But ultimately, when you reach the point where the ester stabilizes, you're both at the same level. But because he got a head start, does he make, does he after, okay, so the guy who got the head start, or not the head start, but pushed it at the beginning with one big dose, even though they're going to level off at six weeks, does he get more gains because he started that bump no. early no it ends no, up the same no. it ends up the same like if both people had the same genetics um the guy who has the 500 milligrams obviously is going to occupy more receptors to start mm -hmm. so more genetic expression there more potential muscle growth mm -hmm. but by the time you get to week six both guys have the same total dose within their body and the same total testosterone level so they're both going to make the same progress at the same weight well, this is kind of a no-brainer for me then because my entire um, aim in the last year or two, ever since I started the podcast and having people, different people want to talk about it, one of the aims I had was can people bodybuild and stay healthy or be healthier? And basically you're saying if we just microdose, we're going to limit the side effects compared to these big, huge spikes. So yeah, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, if person A and person B come to me and they're going to gain the same amount of muscle, but one guy's going to end up losing his hair and whatever, 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 all these other side effects, it's pretty simple to like pick which one you're going to do. Yeah. And if you think about it, if you're doing smaller, more frequent injections, if something does go wrong, you can stop. And again, the, the rate of, I guess, the level dropping off um, isn't going to be as sharp as though you stop someone who's doing one big massive dose per week how do we um, how do we avoid so, the, how do we avoid the annoyance of doing the shot every day <laughs> so this is where this is again where patient if we take um trt for example in the uk yeah. with the, the health service of the uk how they administer trt is with libido which is testosterone under cyclinate and has a half-life of 10 weeks okay so they bring you into the clinic every three months, give you one dose of testosterone and send you home. That can't, yeah, it can't be good. So, so if you think about what we've discussed there, you're giving someone like a thousand milligrams of testosterone undercyclinate yeah. on a Monday. 
the next day their level fucking goes through the roof. Yeah. And for the next 10 weeks, it's slowly doing this. Yeah. By the time they get to week nine, they feel like utter shit. I was just going to say that. Yeah. And then they're, they're, they're relying on this injection and they get this big boost again. And, you know, that sort of drops off over the next four to five weeks. And, and with that, most of them don't even monitor estrogen or DHT conversion. It's just like give them a massive dose. It's going to sustain his level for the next three months. Won't see yeah. him again. It's funny. I have a friend uh, who's on a doctor prescribed TRT. It's like 75 milligrams. He's a little guy. He's like not even a, not really a bodybuilder. He trains for fun. And he's on 75 milligrams every two weeks or something like that. But he tells me he can feel the difference like from the f- first week to the second week. Like he knows yeah. it's time. He knows it's time to get another shot because he, he feels his mood kind of go like this the second week. And yeah, it gets- and that's, that's, that's the same with like TRT doctors that use um, sustenance. So if you don't want to go the route of like Nibido, which is a really long acting one, like every three months, yeah. sustenance because of the blend of the esters is sort of like a shot every three weeks. Yeah. But again, you know, you feel great in the first week and then the levels of how the, the pharmacokinetics works as it drops off. Yeah. yeah. And you sort of end up with this sort of roller coaster where you're, you're manipulating people's levels. Whereas, yeah. you know, if someone had the compliance and didn't mind doing daily injections, they might actually feel better with, you know, 10 milligrams of propionate every day, which is a, a tiny microdose. Yeah. Couldn't you do that with like some of the... Um... Some of the testosterone creams, wouldn't they yield 10 milligrams? Like, how can you just do it that way? Yeah, so you see the problem with creams is then you get transferred to people. If it's on your hands or, you know, even if you, you know, rub it into your groin or whatever, there's still potential that you're transferring it to even like a small kid or something. So Even if you wash creams, your hands? If you wash your yeah, hands, even, though. You know, even, with your, even washing your hands, there can still be residual. And again, on your skin as well, because it doesn't all dissipate straight through your skin. But hmm. if you think about it as well, if you use the cream, the cream gets absorbed instantly. Yeah. Oh, so, same thing. Same thing yeah. again. So you're putting in, I guess, it's sort of probably the same as if you were doing a daily shot of propionate, except, mm-hmm. you know, 10 milligrams of propionate is inside your body. There's no risk of contamination. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you're sort of matching a, a natural person daily, makes somewhere around 7 to 10 milligrams of testosterone naturally per day anyway. And that's where mm-hmm. we see the 10 milligram dose from creams come in. Okay. Um, but yeah, you sort of like, you know, that's, that's sort of like from a health management perspective, if people weren't afraid of injections and were, you know, I guess made responsible to administer their, their medication in the terms of TRT, mm-hmm. they sort of either daily injections or more frequent injections would be better than giving someone a massive dose of libido every three months. I think I'm probably going to land somewhere in the middle. I don't want to do anything every day. I think I'm like a every other you know, day maybe, but like every day seems crazy to me. And you know, that's sort of where you can come in with the balance. So you sort of look at the half-life of the drug. Again, I'm always using an anti because people are sort of aware of it. Yeah. But if you sort of half the half-life of an anti from five to seven days, you end up at three or four days. Yeah. So sort of from a stability perspective, you end up rather than doing, you know, one shot per week to match the half-life, which would be seven days. Yeah. You know, I end up with two injections on a Monday and Thursday. So now you only have to do an injection on Monday and Thursday and you sort of end up with not exactly stable levels, but from a compliance level and not having to inject yourself every single day, it's sort of, you know, a happy medium. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to cover SARMs because they're kind of the latest, greatest in my mind, bullshit. And I don't, <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody out there. I know a lot of you guys are SARM, SARMs lovers. But I was off. I was off for quite a while uh, after my tricep tear, and I actually the year before I had gone off for for a few months, and I wanted to try them myself because I'm like, you know, I I don't want to say anything about anything, whether it's good or bad, until I try it myself. Yep. I got nothing. I got nothing. Like even like there's a little bit of a placebo effect maybe, and then <laughs> yeah. that's about it. And then and I'm like, you know, I always also feel like you know my dad always told me if it's too good to be true, it's probably bullshit and um i want i'd like to know your thoughts about sarms and what you think people are doing with them uh, so sarms when i was doing my phd um we had like a weekly research group within the, the chemistry department where we all sort of delved into a research topic and presented on it mm-hmm. and obviously with my interest with bodybuilding and whatever sarms were starting to become popular so this is around 2007 2008 yeah and 
S4 or Andrean that people might know it as, was sort of entering into phase two clinical trials in humans. And I was sort of looking at the research like, Jesus, that's a great idea that obviously with steroids, when they act on the androgen receptor, it's not selective. So we want primarily the androgen receptors of our muscle tissue to get activated as yeah. opposed to the androgen receptors, say, in our skin or our prostate. So they thought of this great idea with SARMs that these molecules will selectively bind the androgen receptors on muscle tissue with high affinity. Okay. So we get none of these androgenic side effects. So if we give them to females, they're not going to you know, have enlarged uh, female sex hormone growth or they're not yeah. going to have hair growth or oily skin, all this sort of stuff. But then the more I looked at sort of like the research and read through, it's sort of like, okay, we don't really understand exactly the mechanism of action. We don't know exactly how to specifically target muscle cells. Yeah. And it was sort of like, you know, this sort of fool's gold where all these, I guess, underground research companies started flooding them out onto the, the market as, you know, this sort of black label research compound for, you know, research uses. Yeah. And to be honest, I've never seen any of them have any efficacy. And, and mm. like you said, I, I went and got some. I've tried andrine i've tried osterine i tried ligandrol nothing absolutely yeah. nothing and yeah. I, I mean i tried them on like a level of a baseline where it was just you know at cruise level let's see what happens here i'll take yeah. them for four weeks nothing yeah. sorry yeah. you know if you if you were on a cruise level and you added in 50 milligrams of anavar or 50 milligrams of oxandrolone yeah. um, or oxymetolone oxys you know anadrol you'd see an immediate effect in your strength. Like it's, it's yeah. almost, you know, within that session, if you take it two hours before you train, you see the effect. Yeah. This nothing. So, but the, the main point I think that I, I gathered from what you just said is we can't target just the, the androgen, androgen receptor in the muscle. Exactly. So it yeah. seems kind of like a, it's like a really shady promise that, Oh, you don't have to worry about it. Cause that was the part that got me that all the literature yeah. I read, all the literature I read on them was like, Oh, you're going to get strong and you're going to get shredded and your appetite's going to get better, but you're not going to lose your hair. You're not going to, you're not going to get acne. You're not going to nothing and bad. The, and I'm like, the, it's, the, you know, the big selling on it was that it doesn't shut down your HPTA axis. Okay. So it doesn't actually, what shut is down that? Your, what is that for know, those who don't know? So your HPTA is what creates testosterone in your body. So okay. it's the hypothalamus okay. pituitary testicular axis. Okay. So your, hypo, your hypothalamus makes a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone. Yeah. And that goes to the pituitary in your brain. Yeah. And then the pituitary makes LH and FSH. Yeah. Luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and they go to your testicles. Yeah. And the LH, luteinizing hormone, makes testosterone. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens then when you take anabolic steroids, the HPTA axis gets shut down because you yeah. have a high level of testosterone. Yeah. It no longer needs to keep that cycle going. Mm -hmm. the whole thing with SARMs was that basically it was like you can take these compounds they'll only specifically act on your androgen receptors of your muscle tissue and because they're not steroid backbone based they will not interfere with the hypothalamus so you don't get none of the shutdown it's a dream <laughs> but <laughs> I have seen plenty of blood work with consults of people who have used SARMs during PCT yeah. thinking oh I can get away with using this and their HPTA is shut down. And it's yeah. sort of like, this doesn't make sense because they're supposed to act at receptor only and they're not supposed to be steroid based. Yeah. And then you start to see where the, the faux pow comes from it, that you have all these underground pharmaceutical companies spiking SARMs with actual anabolics. Yeah. I was just going <laughs> to say that. Effect. I was going to say that because so, some guys are like, well, I got stronger. I'm like, yeah, that's probably because there's like D-ball mixed into it here and with your fucking SARM. Yeah, and I've seen it because I've seen it again where, where someone came to be looking for PCT after SARMs. And I, I was sort of like, you shouldn't need PCT with any of the SARMs. Yeah, yeah. And then and aside to that, was, as soon as I looked at their lipid panel, their HTL was like rock bottom. And it's sort of like, these compounds should have no effect on androgen receptors within your liver. So they shouldn't have any effect on your lipids. Yeah. And the fact that your HDL is plummeted is telling me that it was actually probably spiked with Anovar or again, D-ball, something cheap that they mixed it. Yeah. Very, very, very low dose to actually make you believe in the power of the placebo. That's right. So where do you think those stand 
when you put them up against pro, like, do you think pro hormones are still useful? Like I know a lot of people are putting like, you know, tribulus or ashagonda or like all these like different ingredients that are going to help boost your natural testosterone. I know it's a different thing, but like, do you ever suggest those things to your clients or, or anybody who asks you or are they on the same level as SARMs? Is it, is it completely different? Like, where are you on that? It would be completely different. So again, the likes of ashwagandha and stuff like that for natural testosterone is more so that cortisol stress hormone can actually drive down levels of testosterone uh, as an okay. artifact of how it affects the pituitary and the adrenal gland. Okay. So taking something like ashwagandha will lower your cortisol level to potentially increase the amount of LH and FSH you could make. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a, not a direct way of increasing. No. And I mean, even all these supplements that I guess sort of buy into the fact that, oh, this is going to boost your natural testosterone. None of them actually work, to be honest, because if you look at, I guess they don't work on a direct level. Like they're not going to tell your testicles make more testosterone because that's what LH does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they may have a, a contributing factor into your, the mental physiology of increasing maybe that you may make slightly more LH yeah. from lower stress and that causes more testosterone to be made or, you know, it lowers your stress. So you sleep better at night. And again, most natural testosterone is produced in healthy people in the morning and in the evening when they sleep. So you, you have potential there for better sleep, better recovery, more testosterone made. It's not that, that the, the compounds are making you make more testosterone. Yeah. And like that, that's one thing I've sworn never to make with supplement needs was it like a male hormone optimization yeah. product because it just, it, it plays on people that uh, people think, oh, I've low testosterone. So if I take this natural test booster, I'm going to get, you know, the same gains as if I take steroids. And yeah. I, I'm not really, you know, we, we toss around a lot of ideas here for our company and a test booster is never really one I was interested in doing. Cause I'm just not, you know, I remember I took tribulus way back in the day. Uh, one of my coaches had me take like a thousand milligrams of tribulus, like a few times a week or something like that. I remember feeling better and I remember feeling like my test levels are better and my sex drive was up. But like you said, it could have been an indirect result yeah. of taking it, not necessarily directly resulting in my test. Yeah. And you have better, potentially better recovery. I mean, when we look at, you know, there's research there for say the likes of, um, Shilajit is a compound that's within, um, it's like a, a natural mineral that's harvested in uh, Himalayan soils. Mm -hmm. They done a, a direct research on, I think it was 30 males where they administered shilajit extract. And they seen a direct increase in gonadotropin releasing hormone, which caused more LH and FSH to be made. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, the mechanism of action, how that works, wasn't really elucidated. But yeah. that's sort of the only thing I've seen in the literature where it's actually proven to increase a male's total testosterone. And again, that could be, again, a bias of that research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but one of our main goals, too, isn't to lower, to lower, lower cortisol, right? So taking ashwagandha isn't necessarily a bad thing because if it lowers cortisol, I mean, we're, that's right in our ballpark anyway. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And you have, again, it all comes down to even if you are assisted, you still need to play on the, the mechanisms of lowering inflammation within the body and obviously lowering the stress response to lower the potential for catabolism so that you are mm -hmm. staying in a, in a primed anabolic environment. Okay. Um, one more question before you go or before we wrap up, we've been on for a little while and I think people have got like a notebook full of information at this point. <laughs> I, I'm trying to soak up years of science and like, a, and uh, I can't, I'm going to have to have you back on because it's just too much. But um, I do want to ask you about supplements in the sense that, I get a lot of questions from people about pre-workouts um, and whether they need to cycle off or stay on them. Cause you know, the, I mean, I'm talking about the stimulant based ones cause I, I don't think you need to cycle off the non-stimulant based ones. I mean, I could be wrong, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I guess what, what people are sort of looking at there is with the stimulant based ones, they sort of, most of them have caffeine as the main stimulant within them. And then obviously yeah. we have some of the, the methyl amine compounds that are sort of elicited use in some supplements. Yeah. Um, it might be worthwhile to cycle off them if you did find that you're having diminished return. Because obviously how caffeine works is it blocks a receptor known as the adenosine receptor. 
Yeah. And adenosine is sort of what makes you feel tired. So when levels of adenosine build up in your brain, that's when you feel sleepy. Okay. Caffeine blocks that receptor. So now you can't have adenosine that's built up in your brain acting to make you tired. And it also then has a level of acting on, you know, dopamine metabolism to increase focus. Okay. So if you were, say, abusing caffeine chronically, so, you know, you're doing like, you know, four scoops of a pre-workout, whereas one used to work. Yeah. yeah. And you might need to cycle off and give yourself, you know, the, the clear out or the, I guess, the, the resensitization to caffeine is quite quick. It's somewhere in yeah. around 10 to 14 days. That's sort yeah. of when you get back to that baseline. So obviously you're going to have a horrible period where that's where dependency, where caffeine can cause a slight withdrawal mechanism because again, through hydration mechanisms, it can, um, I guess, lead you to have headaches in the first few days following yeah. stopping its use. Yeah. Now, if you don't have any issues where you don't have any sort of, you don't abuse caffeine, you're not chronically ingesting, say, coffee or, you know, stimulant drinks throughout the day, having one serving of a pre-workout every day is fine. Yeah. Provided, again, that you're paying attention to those those cues of, are you getting the, the desired effect of mm-hmm. stimulant-based focus? Um, and again, your sleep, because you have to play into sort of the half-life some people, again, that we could have went off on that tangent when we were speaking about um, AAS, is that some people can be fast metabolizers of compounds and others can be slow metabolizers based on their yeah. genetics. That was, you know what? It's so funny you said that. I told myself before you came on, I wanted to ask you about that. All right, let's, you know what, let's get it. Okay, let's get this last one because this is yeah. important. No, no, this is, no, no, I'm serious because, okay, I'm, I'm going to sound like a bro scientist for a second, okay? I keep hearing this... Uh, this term is like hypersensitive, you know, steroid user. And I'm like, that's bullshit. And it probably isn't bullshit. You're probably going to tell me why it's not bullshit, but I hate that saying because I think people use it as a crutch. Like you'll see a guy who's like done some steroids, but he's doesn't eat properly. He trains like shit. And then he, yeah. he'll point to someone like me or another pro and be like, Oh, he must be a hypersensitive you know, user. And I'm like, no, it's because your diet sucks and your training sucks. Yeah. So I just really, really hate this term. And I'm, I'm hoping you're telling me that it's false, but I know you're not gonna. So, 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 but how I'll explain this is basically your, obviously your liver metabolizes compounds. And we were speaking about there about the, the half-life and the elimination and all that on a genetic level. So again, to try and make this simple, you have these enzymes in your liver called CYP450s, cytochrome okay. 450 enzymes. Now, these enzymes, from a chemistry perspective, do stuff that we could never do in labs. Like our body is capable of doing some transformations to chemical molecules that defy what we are able to do physically within a lab. Okay. How those enzymes work is that they either you know, change the structure of the compound so, for example, aromatase is a CYP450 enzyme. Okay. And that converts testosterone to estrogen. Yeah. So you have other CYP enzymes that can oxidize testosterone. It can, you know, change the structure of testosterone. And by changing the structure, now it's able to be excreted from the body. Okay. On a genetic level, you can have people who are either, um, I guess, Fast metabolizers, meaning that their CYP enzymes operate at a faster rate compared to a normal individual. Mm -hmm. So in that case, a fast metabolizer is metabolizing testosterone really fast and getting it out of body. So you can see that someone potentially could take, um, I'll get to this now in a second. I'll explain a slow metabolizer is someone then whose CYP enzymes are on operating at a slower rate so the compound stays in their body longer okay so it's more beneficial so so on a muscle building perspective would be more beneficial because it means that and i've seen this with blood work you can have two individuals who are natural who are starting their first steroid cycle and say they they choose 300 milligrams as their, their starting dose of testosterone yeah you'd get the two of them to get their blood work done at the six week mark you know when everything stabilizes the, the person who took the 300 milligrams, um, who's a slow metabolizer, 
could end up with a test level of like way over 150 nanomolar, which would be like, you know, into nearly the 4,000s, I yeah. think, in, in terms of nanograms. Yeah. Whereas your fast metabolizer could take the same dose and end up with a level of, say, 60 nanomolar, which is, yeah. you know, maybe 2,000. So you now have this, you know, slow metabolizer with a compound staying in their system longer. And provided they have favorable genetics, potentially they may need less compound than the fast metabolizer. And that's sort of where you can see, you know, non-responders because someone could be metabolizing the compound where they think they're taking a certain dosage yeah, and it's not hitting the peak that it should be. And, that, you know, that's sort of provided that whatever gear they're taking is exactly dosed as well. Because I was just going to ask you that. So basically the guy that has a fast clearance, um, and I'm just going to use simplistic terms, forgive me if they're wrong, but the guy who has fast clearance, he's got to take more. If he, if he takes more, does he equal the guy with slow clearance? Again, it depends on their blood work and monitoring what happens. But in theory, the fat, like if you know your genetics, a fast metabolizer is potentially going to need slightly more compound to be on par to someone who has normal genetics. No, I understand that. But can he equal his, and I know it's, it's obviously not a definite answer, but hypothetically or theoretically, can he equal the slow metabolizers gains if he takes a little more? Yes, he would, because again, okay. you're sort of the slow metabolizer, the compound remains in the system longer. So there's more chance for androgen receptor yeah. activation. Whereas the fast metabolizer, the compound's getting clearer before cleared before it can act at the receptor. You know so what you just given, You know what you just fast did? Metabolizer, what? You just gave me an excuse to tell people why I take so much shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fast metabolizer, as I have to. The doctor said so. But you can, you can get this done, and I've done it myself. I have my yeah. genetics mapped from uh, 23 and me. And you can, you can then plug it into there's online uh, databases like Genetic Genie or Prometheus, and that will screen your genetics from 23 and me's raw data yeah. and show you what CYP enzymes work faster and what ones work slower. So you can actually figure out if you're a hypersensitive or if you're sorry, a fast clearance or slow clearance yeah. person, yeah, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. I, like I, I have, it's a pity I didn't send it to you. Like I have a slide from a talk I gave at the British body power last year yeah. where I went through my genetics and showed, you know, this is a, a side tangent. Um, but what sort of led me down that road was my own mother yeah. has to take um, antidepressant medication. Yeah. And over the years they were like bumping her dosage up. And it didn't make sense. Like she yeah. ended up at a dose that like, you'd be like, why is she on that dose? Yeah. Yeah. But then when I went into my own genetics, it turns out that I'm a fast metabolizer. You're fast clearance. Yeah. Of that CYP enzyme that metabolizes that drug. Yeah. 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 And I was sort of able to tell her then I was able to say to her, it's not that the doctors think, you know, oh, we need to keep giving her more medicine. It's actually that your body needs the higher dose to yield a stable level that has an effect. So what, when you do those tests, does it tell you what the normal range is there for like, again, forgive me if I'm speaking in simplistic terms, but is there a normal range for your CYP that they'll tell you? So, you know, if no, you're fast so, or slow. So, so it'll actually it'll look at genetic variances and it'll be like, say for example, CYP three a is a, um, oxidative CYP for testosterone. Yeah. So it'll either tell you if you're plus plus, plus minus or minus minus and so, minus you know, minus is slow yeah for example it could be slow you know different reports report it's not like there's a standard way oh, okay but the report will actually tell you you know oh plus minus is the the normal variant oh i get and it and then okay. you know plus plus would be fast and then minus minus would be slow but it explains to you on the report which one is which i gotta get this done now this is interesting. The 23 and me, 23 and me does it. Yeah. So you get 23 and me done. If you just even get the ancestry 23 and me. Yeah. It'll say it. It's lit. Yeah. It's literally you just take a swab, the, the DNA swab from your cheek, yeah. send it back. The, you then get your raw report. So 23 and me will give you all your genetics in like a zip file. Yeah. Yeah. And you literally just go to either genetic genie or Prometheus and you put that zip file into the website, both of them are a voluntary contribution if you want to yeah. contribute to the website but it's essentially free yeah. and you get back a pdf for all these cyps of, of you know which ones are fast which ones are slow and then there's you know databases that you can just put in 
what does CYP XX do? Okay, two, qu figure out. two questions before you go. Have you looked up any pros? Have you helped any pros look up their CYP? No, no one's ever come to me about it. I'm so I'm be, I'm really curious. I want to know. Really curious, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the second question is for anybody with a fast clearance of their of their CYP. Am I saying that correctly? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. That's, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, anybody with a fast clearance, is there a way? It, can they? Is there anything they can do to slow it down? So there are certain compounds that can have an inhibitory effect on CYPs. Okay. So if you ever look. Um, the whole thing of there's other compounds that can speed up CYPs as well. This is what I'm trying to get at. So the likes of, you know, estrogen, bioperine, all these ingredients that uh, okay. the supplements, yeah. they have an effect on your CYP metabolism. In, a, in an increase or decrease, or you don't know? De increase, increase. Okay, okay. It's, okay. Very, it's very difficult. There are certain compounds, but they wouldn't be accessed as natural. That would slow down, you know, the CYPs that oxidize testosterone. One minute. I have a question. So in supplements, do, don't we want a faster clearance? For some of them, yes. Yes. So if we, so now we're stuck, we, we're stuck in a, like a, a bad place now. Cause we're like, we want to slow down our clearance for the anabolics, but we don't want to, <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, fortunately from the top of my head, the likes of estrogen or bioperine don't speed up the um, enzymes which metabolize testosterone itself okay okay um but there are certain people that would try and use say the likes of grapefruit which is a known um inducer of cyp to speed up the enzyme which how means do we, that the more important question is how do we slow it down um i'll have to i'll have to look up a list of stuff but i don't think there's anything accessible naturally that that can slow it down well i know what all the guys watching are thinking they're like i'm a, I'm a fast <laughs> yeah. i'm a fast responder i need to slow this shit down <laughs> now if you think about it if you slow things down this is where it gets very interesting because okay the slow metabolizer is fortunate and that the compound stays in the body longer yeah but that's sort of viewing it from a perspective of androgens only yeah if you apply that then to any sort of drug compound that is CYP metabolized, it could lead to very, you know, adverse reactions in that they could be prescribed a drug That's and it right. stays in their system longer. So the doctor's giving them a prescription for something and it can build up slowly over time to toxic levels. I see. We, I see. we see that when it's applied to the likes of say um, an antibiotic, there, there's sort of case studies done on, um, I think it's, Ionazid is the name of the antibiotic. Mm -hmm. But basically, if you're a slow metabolizer, if, it, if it's prescribed to you by a doctor, after, say, a week, you could reach toxic levels because your body's not excreting yeah, out the yeah. compound. But that's actually a good point. So if, if I do want something to, 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 to clear my body faster, you're saying estrogen or grapefruit or there's a number of things we can do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's, okay. why, that's why we add those... Um, why we see those added to um, pre-workouts and obviously pump products is to increase the rate at which we have either intestinal absorption so that mm -hmm. it gets metabolized faster or it slows that, you know, it speeds up the utilization of the compound in the body. So that it has a faster effect. I see. I see. Well, doctor, uh, <laughs> it's been, it's been, <laughs> it's been an hour and a half of like <laughs> intense research on my part. <laughs> um, <laughs> You have to come back on sometime, please, because Definitely. I I know after people watch this, I'm going to have a million other questions from them. So uh, I, if you don't mind, I would like to have you go on again sometime in the future. Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Before you go, I'd like to give everybody the opportunity to plug or promote anything that they are doing. So anything that you're you're selling or from trying to promote. I, I guess, no, if, if people want to follow me, if they're not already, my Instagram is just DNSTM. And obviously the, the supplement company that has all the stuff in the UK is supplementneeds.co.uk. Um, other than that, to, uh, just really grateful for the chance to come on. And as, as you said, the start's just unfortunate, the, the circumstances given. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. But I do think people are going to get a lot of benefit out of it. So I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, we'll do it again soon. Perfect. Thanks very much. For okay, that. doctor. Thank you very much, man. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Please subscribe, share with your friends, 
and like the video. And if you get a chance, check out the description for all the different links to all the different places you can find Hostile and myself. And lastly, check out Hostile.com for our new line of supplements and all of our apparel and gear. Thanks again for watching.